I'm Hemant Mehta. And I'm Jessica Blumke. And you're listening to the podcast for FriendlyAtheist.com. Today's episode is brought to you by Be Secular. Be free to love. Be able to choose. Be accepted no matter your race, gender, sexual orientation, or belief system. Be Secular. Be Secular merchandise allows you to display your support for equality and the separation of church and state while also donating up to 50% of the profit from your purchase to nonprofits, groups, and artists that support those same values. Go to www.besecular.com, pick your item, and then choose who you want to get a donation from your sale. Listeners of this podcast will get a 10% discount if they use the promo code FRIENDLY. Make a statement. Be you. Be secular. Steve Wells is the author of the amazing Skeptics Annotated Bible, the website and the print book, which documents all the contradictions and horrible things the Bible says. It is honestly one of the most useful websites for atheists I have ever seen, and you can check it out at skepticsannotatedbible.com. The print version of the book, like I said, is a must-have. Wells is also the author of Drunk with Blood, which documents all of God's killings in the Bible. And his newest book is called Strange Flesh, and it's about how the Bible is used by both sides of the culture wars to justify anti-gay bigotry or, depending on who you talk to, support LGBT rights. So, Steve, thank you so much for being with us. Well, you're welcome. It's great to be here. So your work, I mean, anyone who's seen the Skeptics Annotated Bible, it is so meticulous, it's so comprehensive. I mean, you've really gone through the entire Bible and chronicled where, you know, all the misogyny is and where all the instances of cruelty are. Um, how, how does that process even happen? I mean, are you reading through the Bible so many times? Are you reading through it once and just keeping... I, I feel like there should be, like, a lineup on the wall somewhere that you might see in a movie. Like, someone has pictures of everyone and highlighting like a things. beautiful mind. Yeah, exactly. And, like, highlighters going everywhere. How do you go through that process of yeah, that's, documenting all this? That's pretty, that's pretty much how it starts. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, I, I was reading the Bible for the first time, um, and the reason that I was doing it is that my sister was in the process of becoming a Jehovah's Witness. And yeah. so I thought, well, if I'm going to talk her out of this, I need to know the Bible better. And so I just started reading the Bible and, and highlighting stuff, you know, as I went along. And before I got through Exodus, I, I was thinking to myself, well, why hasn't anyone, why hasn't anyone else done this from a, from you know, highlighted and, and presented the Bible from a skeptic's point of view. That's, and so I decided uh, that I would go ahead and do that. In co- in high school, a friend of mine gave me a Bible mm-hmm. because she wanted me to, to read the Bible and become a Christian. But uh, what I ended up using it for is exactly, Steve, what you're talking about, where I started like, that was the first copy I actually had, a real sure. nice copy. And I was like using the little, uh, what do you call them, the, the blue the sticky po- notes, post-it notes? post-it notes. And I was like, here's a contradiction with this one. And little they had weird little footnote references. Oh, and then I discovered Skeptic's Annotated Bible. I'm like, oh, someone's already done this. I don't have to do this myself. I don't have to do this <laughs> myself. <laughs> it was great. How long did that process take then for you? Or is it un- is it ongoing or is it a completed project? Well, it, I started it in 1989, um, and I've been working on it really ever since. Uh, so you know, it's been 25 years. But what what I um, what it took me the first you know after I started, I worked my way through the Bible. It took me you know a year or two to to kind of get through it and and uh just I, at first i kind of flew through it and just highlighted all of the the things that really strike you you know as a well as anyone <laughs> yeah uh just the hor- the horrendous crazy absurd you know nasty stuff mm-hmm. um in in the bible that would be pretty much any anyone that any highlighted verse would be pretty much a um uh, a belief killer you know at least it would seem like it it it, it should be um it should be to anyone that read it. Um, and so I, w- I wasn't too concerned about being thorough because uh, certainly I had hundreds of, uh, hundreds of uh, passages that there were hundreds of passages that were pretty obvious. And all I had to do was just really highlight those. But then, of course, when you get into the contradictions and whatnot and the prophecies, uh, you know, it starts to get more difficult. It gets more difficult, of course, as anything does, the more complete a job you try to do. Mm-hmm. So and in, so I had to keep 
keep at it, you know, for 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 quite a while. And and, and what happened was I, I I went through it, and I, I intended to do it in a, in book form. You know, that was my original intention. But I, at the time, I couldn't find a publisher, um, and so I kind of gave up and put it aside for a while. Um, until then, the internet came along, and I kind of knew it would do it would work there. So then I put it up on the internet. So this is interesting. You've I mean, I got introduced to your work through your website, but I've I've seen your print books. I mean, the the Skeptics Annotated Bible hard copy, it looks and feels like a real Bible with like the red little nice ribbon and everything. And it's kind of like a Shakespeare guide you might read where you have the original text and then in the margins you have it labeled like here's an example of misogyny, here's an example of sacrifices or whatever. Um but one thing I wanted to ask you you said you couldn't find a publisher, and it seems like you are publishing all of these things through your own personal imprint that you created. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's that's right. I didn't. I, it was at the time that I started this thing. It was very hard to do that. You know, you either had a publisher or or a lot of money. Maybe you've had a lot of money, you might be able to do it on on your own. But um, I didn't have, you know, I, I didn't have a lot of money and I couldn't find a publisher. So I, I felt kind of stuck and I was pretty disappointed with, I mean, I still, I sort of did it just for my own use, you know? So it, it what I would, I felt like it was worthwhile, even if I couldn't get it published because, you know, it was helpful to me. I mean, and the internet, um, the website was great. It helped a lot of people, I'm sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, the web, the website is just a natural for the website. And the nice thing about the web, you know, is when you, you can continuously add to it and, you know, correct it as you go. And so um, it's it's a great medium for that. So you kind of mentioned earlier, and I think we've all heard this before, that anybody who, you know, anybody who's actually read the Bible cover to cover is probably a non-believer. What do you say when people who say they're Christians and yeah, I've read the Bible. I you know, I know it. I know it front and back. Like what do you say when you have not only read it but so closely read it? What do you say to them? Like do you say are you an idiot? Like did you not do you not understand what that meant? Well, I I guess that's that's what I that's I don't really think that. I don't say it, of course, and and I don't really think that because I know too many very intelligent people that have done just that. Um, it's amazing what people can justify. It's as though you had a Jew- Jewish person that was taken mind camp, you know, mm. and was was trying to and trying to say that that wasn't, you know, that's not really, it's not really an, anti-Semitic, you know. It, it um, and the, the Bible it, to me is is much the same, you know. It almost everything that it, that the Bible is telling you, with, with 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 some some exceptions, you know, there's some good stuff in the Bible, mm-hmm. some some pretty good stuff, and not very much, but there is some. <laughs> but with that exception, with the, with those exceptions, um, the 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 horrible stuff is really horrible. That and nobody believes that you should execute a, a woman who is in a, you know, who is who is in, a virgin on her wedding night or a disobedient child or mm-hmm. you should burn people to death you know like is uh, is actually is an actual punishment for for some crimes in the bible mm-hmm. um no one today or or has believed that or really they haven't really believed it in at least 400 years or at least a few hundred years mm-hmm. So it's amazing to me that anybody can read that stuff and say well yeah yeah I believe this in fact I based my whole life upon it you know, I, I I don't understand that, but but people, you know, most people, most Christians haven't read it, but uh, and and those that the really serious Christians have, and they're very good at finding a nice sounding explanation for the for the for the you know the worst atrocities in the Bible. I it's really I I give them a lot of credit for the effort and. Um, and their 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 ability to to rationalize the you know that stuff in the Bible. Was there Somehow anything? They do it. I don't. Was there anything in your research when you were reading through the Bible and documenting all this that just stood out to you? Like you had no idea it said that. You know, almost all of it did. You know, <laughs> I, and, and 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 I was and I was a uh, I was a believer. Now I didn't start out a believer. I came from a non-religious family, but. Um, in uh, in in high school, my sister, the one that was becoming Jehovah's Witness, <laughs> became a Catholic because she married a Catholic. You know, <laughs> and and I and and I would go to church with her and stuff, and we'd argue all the time about religion. But I I uh, I never read the Bible, but I ended up convincing myself 
that I believed that I believed in God, and I, um, it, you know, I became a Christian. And then when I became a Christian, I said, "Well, what the heck? I'm going to become a Catholic." And I said, "Well, I'll, okay, I'm going to become a Catholic priest." And I ended up going to a seminary to the seminary of Archbishop Lefebvre. You know, the, the um, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he's the the guy that was excommunicated. Uh, in the eighties because he was so extreme, you oh, know, man, before uh, my time, extreme <laughs> conservative. Yeah. So I, I went all the way and went crazy on it, you know? And then in the seminary, I kind of, I, I, all of the, the, I started to doubt, you know, some of the, I, I jumped too quickly through some kind of important questions like the existence of God, the, 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 the idea of hell, um, the problems that evolution presents and, you know, all that, that whole, that whole mess. Mm. And so I ended up spending a lot of time arguing with the professors at the university, I mean, at the seminary, and ended up leaving. Although I was still a Catholic. In fact, uh, we, my, I married a, a, a uh, my wife is, was a traditionalist Catholic, and all of our four children are baptized Catholic. Mm. Um, but uh, after the, my, our fourth child was born, when he was still a baby, um, at that point I decided I didn't believe it any longer. That was 1988, and so it was the next year when I actually started this Bible project. But I, I hadn't read it as a Catholic. Well, that's not too surprising. Catholic. Yeah, that's, I've heard <laughs> I've heard that from many Catholics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you let the Church figure all that stuff yeah. out, you know? Sure. Um, are you familiar with the Jefferson Bible? Because this project kind of reminds me a lot of, of what Thomas Jefferson did. Cutting out all the supernatural yeah. stuff. Yeah, I guess for people who don't yeah. know, uh, Thomas Jefferson went through, I think it was just the New Testament, and physically yes, took a razor and cut out the stuff that he liked, like the stuff that wasn't supernatural, that was just moral teachings, pasted that into a new book, and it's become the Jefferson Bible. Are you um, like, are you familiar with that? Do you take inspiration? Do you think that's a helpful exercise? Do I think it's a helpful exercise? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's um, that's pretty much what the good stuff that I have. You know, I have. Uh, I I'd have to check how many. You know, there are several hundred uh, verses in the Bible that I have marked as good, and they they would have been <laughs> the same ones. That, that, you know, I like how that's a separate annotation that you got to make. This is a good section. <laughs> yeah. Well, I it, it was. I didn't start. I didn't. In the beginning, I only had a few categories, and and none of them were good. But then I decided, well, you know, there are uh, Leviticus nineteen eighteen, uh, love your neighbor as yourself. That's that's a that's that's a, that's a good idea. So, and so I highlighted that's just a shame that in the next chapter you're you're executing homosexuals and you have to burn to death a, a man who has sex with a, with his wife and his mother in law. You know, I have to burn all three to death. They know what they did. And, and I don't know how you I don't know how you love your neighbor as you're burning him to death, but somehow you've got to be doing that. Contradiction. <laughs> Check mark. Yeah. <laughs> so, let me ask you about your other book. Uh one of the, the other books called Drunk with Blood. So you kind of you again, I don't know if you did additional research for this one or if you just used the ones you'd already done, but you went through and you said, here's a passage in the Bible where God kills people. Um, this is what the Bible says. Mm-hmm. Um, but based on, you know, research or whatever, I don't know, you can tell us that you said, here's like what the Bible explicitly says. And here's the estimate based off of that. Um, and of like how, what was body that? Count? Yeah, a body Oof. count. And what was what did you figure out at the end of that whole process? And how did you figure oh, out God. those numbers? Well, you know, in some cases, the Bible tells you um, exactly how many people were killed. And in other cases, it doesn't. You know, so um, if you take just the Bible's numbers, that number that it turns out to be about two and a half million. Um, but if you, all had it I, I, if you try, to es- try to estimate it, then it's you know, 25 million uh, some, somewhere. It depends. I mean, who, sometimes the Bible just said he killed... People everyone in some area and well, you don't know, know how many flood alone yeah yeah, yeah. Or, or how many people died in the floods you know right. that's it's kind of hard to know how many people died in an imaginary flood you know? <laughs> and how did you make <laughs> your estimates point. how did you make your, <laughs> how did you make your estimates for the imaginary flood deaths how many unicorns uh, died in the flood the death? <laughs> i used the best well christians say that it happened in in uh, about 2400 bc and then you can. I, I got a, a book by I, I forget the authors, but it's it's a it's a it's a book by historians who have may, have their best estimates of human populations at various places in Earth at that time. And the, the human population at the time was thought to be uh, about twenty million. 
Um, and so that's the value that I used in my estimate. So at the the worst possible way, you said it's about twenty five million. Uh-huh. If you take explicitly what the Bible says, conservative estimate, yeah, we're talking two and a half. Estimate. That's like two and a half million. And how many people did Satan kill in the Bible? Good question. Uh, well, that ten, ten, actually. <laughs> um, and uh, t- ten, and and God deserved. The credit for that. If you were having a murder <laughs> trial, <laughs> then they they would both be you know they would both be equally guilty, uh, yeah. or maybe God would even be more guilty. I, I don't know. I it's have like seen have known better. I have seen those memes comparing God's deaths and Satan's deaths, and that's all based off of your work. But those memes have been floating around for so long, and it's hilarious. It's like, oh, Satan, not a bad guy. <laughs> God's I, kind yeah, of an asshole. In the Bible, he, you know, no, in the Bible, he's he's actually a pretty good guy. Um, <laughs> um, at least, at least he would have been if he wasn't hanging out with with God. You I, know? God's a bad influence on Satan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I actually, when I was, I don't know, maybe a sophomore or junior in, in college, and I was just kind of like trying my atheist hat on. We were reading Paradise Lost, and we'd read like the first like a little chunk of it, and I remember being very like. This is bullshit. Like, God is laying down these rules that are completely arbitrary, and that's nonsense, and blah, 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 blah. And my professor, or maybe it was a student, but somebody looked at me and was like, you sound like Satan from later in the book. And I was like, I don't know how to take that. And now, <laughs> Now you found out it's a compliment. compliment. 100%. Yeah. <laughs> you also, uh, you did the Skeptic's Annotated Bible with, literally, the Bible, but you've also now done the Quran. You've also done the Book oh, of Mormon wow. and done... The same stuff. So did you do the same process? Did you read through all of it? Or did you say, hey, person who actually knows the Book of Mormon, why don't you come help me out here? No, that would have been good. No, I did it all myself. (laughs) And it's, uh, but the Book of Mormon and the Quran were both done like I did the Bible. Um, Like the first time when I did the Bible, just kind of flying through it and highlighting the, you know, like the Book of Mormon, the main idea of the Book of Mormon is that that Jews sailed to the New World, you know, um, and uh, some of them were bad, and so God turned their skin dark, and that's where Indians came from. (sighs) So and and that's that's pretty much that's that's the Cliff Notes version of of the Book of Mormon. You know that's that's what it's about. Uh, so of course I'm going to be highlighting the the parts where this silly thing about the the Jews building a boat and sailing to the you know t- sailing to the uh, uh, to North America, um, along with times when God is turning people's skin dark because they misbehaved. Uh, but beyond that, other than highlighting all the end that came to passes, um, I, I, uh, and the other crazy stuff, <laughs> I didn't go through it thoroughly. But that's what we're mm-hmm. trying to do now. In fact, my son, um, uh, uh, Philip, is um, going through and doing blog posts on each of the chapters of the Book of Mormon. And he's almost done. And when he's done, and, re- and so we we're revising the website as he does that. Mm-hmm. And then when he's, when he's done with that, which uh, he only has about 30 chapters to get, Go. We're gonna we're gonna do the um, Book of Mormon as a book. Fantastic! Well. Awesome. Put that in the Marriott hotels. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, Steve, let's talk about Old Testament versus New Testament. Like, is uh-huh. is the Old Testament a billion times worse? Is there a lot more slaughter and like things kind of even out in New Testament? Or is the New Testament also oh, pretty man. bad? Yeah, I I think actually that in the the New Testament may be worse than the old. Really? Uh, in the sense that, well, in in the sense that the New Testament all, really invents the idea of hell. And if if there's a bad idea that 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 anyone's ever had, hell has to be right up there as being one of the worst. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the idea that you would that you would torture someone forever after they die for whatever reason is 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 a really horrible idea. And that's and that's the idea of that's I guess that's one of the main ideas of the of the New Testament, and I think Jesus gets an awful lot too uh, too much credit for being a good guy. I mean, he he said some nice things, but he also said some really nasty things. Yeah, you know, saying that people should hate their families and love him more than their families, and um, that and cursing cursing entire generations um, just because they didn't like his preaching. You know, he he could be kind of kind of a nasty guy. And Paul was was uh, was a, was a very unlikable likable guy. He he didn't say very much that was nice. There's a little bit here and there that's nice, but mostly it's 
it's um, it's not very nice stuff. And so, you, I mean, you don't have – it's not all about animal sacrifice. You don't have to be doing that. That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> I wish someone would uh, say this in you church. Have to burn Just one day. <laughs> Come well, on, you guys. Then, New Testament then, isn't all about animal sacrifice. <laughs> That's we can all get Jesus said yeah. some horrible no, things. So when people in, in any book that ends is bad, I mean, it certainly ends badly, right? With sure. Revelation, you, yeah. you can't yeah. worse than that. So, Steve, when people say to you, "Like I get my moral guidance from the Bible," what, <laughs> is that code for I have never read it? <laughs> no, I don't know. I don't. I don't. Uh, they don't. Of course, sure. uh, no one gets their guidance for the, from the Bible, and they haven't for two thousand years. Even one of the fa- favorite uh, lines that are or or, or uh, little uh, stories in the Bible in, in the New Testament is where where Jesus is being criticized by the uh, Pharisees for not washing his hands. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he says, well, you guys don't kill disobedient children like it tells you to do in Leviticus. Hmm. And <laughs> and so even even at the time of Jesus, the people had, had realized that we shouldn't be killing disobedient children anymore. So you we know? haven't said anything um, original in 2,000 years. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, even even at the time of Jesus, people weren't following what the Bible said, because the Bible was just too cruel. Um and, and no one has. No one. No one has has done what what the what the Bible says. And and no, I don't think anyone ever really has tried to do what the what the Bible says. I don't think anybody really takes Jesus seriously when he says that you should hate your family, uh, like he very clearly did in in Luke. Um, so yeah, I, people don't get their morals from the Bible, um, although they do find some nice things in the Bible and they do try to live up to those. You know, mm. they they're. They they take some of the better parts of the Bible and they say, see, look at the point at that and say, see, that's what I'm, that's where I'm getting my morals from. Do Christians so ever they tell get, you they do get their morals kind of from the Jefferson Bible? You know, they yeah. kind of get their 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 morals from that, but they they ignore the rest of it. Do Christians ever tell you that by going through line by line and and trying to tell us where all the bad stuff is, you're just kind of missing the bigger picture here, and that's what you should be focused <laughs> yes. on. Absolutely, you get that all the time. That if you look at the Bible as a whole, um, then it's very clear that it's, it's all about Jesus. Um, you know, he, he, when God says that He's He's going to corrupt your seed and spread dung upon your faces, Oof. like He does in Malachi Malachi two three, um, that's all about Jesus. Somehow, I don't. I'm not. I'm not sure exactly <laughs> how, but somehow it is. Um, and and so, but they would tell you that every single thing in the Bible is um, is pointing toward and directing tr- directing you toward Jesus. And then Jesus said all these nice things, and so you should follow that. Um, so that's kind of the basic way that they 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 claim that you have you you have to look if you look at it in that from that perspective, then you can really justify anything in it. I guess at least that's what they <laughs> yeah. have to claim. But I mean, you you can justify anything and anything. You can find good and moral lessons in any book. I just oh no, I just I I get frustrated. What can I say? <laughs> yeah, you can you can do a lot better with just about any random book that you pick up. Yeah, you know. So tell us a little bit about this new book. Uh, you talk about uh, what you learned about the biblical justifications for and against homosexuality. Uh, what did you discover that maybe we haven't heard before? Well, I think that the, the the fun part about this project for me was realizing how it's used, especially by liberals, to justify to 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 be able to say that the Bible both says nothing about either says nothing about homosexuality or uh, that it actually sa- says uh, it actually approves of homosexuality. Is that a fair uh, interpretation? And... No, no, it's not. Uh, the the Bible, when it speaks clearly. And it, it doesn't say much about homosexuality. There's only five verses, uh, yeah, five or six, depending on you know what you consider. You, people will kind of argue about this, but there's only a handful of verses that are explicit about homosexuality, and those five very clearly condemn it. Mm. But so when liberals, uh, when liberal Christians are using the Bible to say, and I mean, there's a very popular book out by a guy named Matthew Vines 
right now talking yeah. about mm -hmm. how the Bible actually supports uh, LGBT rights or uh, their, whatever it is. What what is he yep. getting wrong? What what is he doing that he shouldn't be doing? Well, I, I I can't really say with regard to Matthew Vines because I haven't read his book. Um, I've listened to some of his uh, his talks on on uh, YouTube uh, on YouTube and stuff. Yeah, uh, so I think I kind of have an idea of what he's saying. I'm, um, and with regard to the, the five explicit verses that condemn homosexuality, there, there, are, there are some arguments that can be made, sometimes quite good arguments. For example, for example one of the big, big uh, questions is, um, what was going on at Sodom? You know, what was the sin of Sodom? Why did God kill everyone in Sodom and Gomorrah? And, of course, conservatives say that God killed everyone in, in Sodom because of, they were trying to commit homosexual rape on Lot's guests, you know, angels that were visiting there, and they wanted to have sex with them, with these angels who looked like guys, I guess pretty good-looking guys. And that's, and so that shows God's hatred for homosexuality, and that's that's where the word sodomite would come for, you know, that's used, mm -hmm. uh, still used by conservative Christians. Whereas liberals will look at that and say, well, it wasn't about that at all. It was about hospitality. Um, they weren't being you, hospitable you know, have, to those angels, and that's why. They weren't why. being hospitable. No, they had these guests, <clears throat> and uh, Lot had some guests, and they wanted to do nasty things to them. Uh, you know, it's okay that he, that Lot, uh, when this happened, offered his virgin daughters to instead. That, I that knew I'd okay. heard this one. But the, I, <laughs> yeah, that was all right. But the idea that that these guys, these guys just wanted to have sex with these, with the, with these. Angels that appeared like men, and that got God so upset because he hates homosexuality so much. But anyway, the, the liberals have a pretty good argument here because everywhere else in the Bible, when it talks about the sin of Sodom, it talks about it being greed and not taking care of the poor. And there's a long list of things that happen that are, that are said throughout the Bible that don't say anything about homosexuality, but, but say that the sin of Sodom was something else. And so they have a pretty good argument in that case. Um, and then they all they, they do a similar thing like when in Leviticus eighteen, um, chapter eighteen, where it talks about um, uh, homosexuality being an abomination. Um, they have a a fairly good well. Of course, there's some a, a good response to that. It's a fairly obvious response to that. Is is so we're shellfish and. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so we're we're eating shellfish, a lot, a, a very uh, four-legged, flying, creeping things are an abomination to to God. A lot, there's a long list of of things that really creep God out, and <laughs> homosexuality is just one of them. <laughs> so, since we ignore God about the shellfish and about the four-legged, flying, creeping things, we can <laughs> we can we can ignore God on homosexuality as well. And so they, they 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 have explanations for all of the when when Saint Paul talks about um, um, the only verse in the Bible. There's one only one verse in the Bible that deals explicitly with with uh, lesbianism, and that's in uh, in Romans. Yeah. And but they have a they have a good rationale for most of these. Not a good rationale, but they have an they have, they have an, a rationale, uh, a, right. an explanation. They have a rationale that explains why the particular verse, which which seems to as you when you read it to be very clearly a condemnation of homosexuality they have a, a reason why they think it wasn't but the more the funnest thing about it i mean the, about the the project is looking at what they do with jesus <laughs> and with yahweh and with paul they make them all they're all homosexuals you know hmm. uh, and, and you know if, if god that himself one. is homosexual yeah. <laughs> expound <laughs> okay well uh, the um, Paul, for, let's say Paul. That's a little. That's one of the. It's a little easier to see how they get there with Paul. Paul had was troubled by this thorn in his flesh. He had, he had trouble, with, and it was had involved one of his members. He doesn't say which member it was, but it was driving him crazy, and he hated himself for it. Uh, he said that he did all kinds of things that were hateful, and he just couldn't stop. Mm -hmm. And 
and and he warned everyone else not to get married and to, and to stay away from you and what he thought that it was better for men not to touch women. So what the liberals are, are saying is that they suspect that the, what Paul's thorn was was homosexuality. So Paul was homosexual. Interesting. Um, so that's a, that's a pretty... That's a pretty easy one. Now, to get G- Jesus to be gay is a little bit tougher, but not too bad, because Jesus actually never said he loved anyone in in the Bible, um, except for, at least, it, except for in the Gospel of John. The other three Gospels, there's only one person that he was said to have loved, and and that was the uh, the rich man um, and the, the, the rich young man who asked him, you know, what do I need to do to... to uh, to achieve a, a, a eternal life, Jesus looked at him with love. Well, you know, that pretty much did it there. When he looked at him with love, then what they have is that Jesus actually, you know, he you know he had a thing going with this guy. Wait, so is, they have that. Is that really yeah. the only time they say Jesus loves somebody or something? Is that really the only time it's mentioned? Yes, it is. Except for in the Gospel of of John, in Je- the Gospel of John has Jesus loving four people. Um, he, of course, the the uh, the the disciple whom Jesus loved, uh, which that's another story where Jesus, uh, the disciple whom Jesus loved, is mentioned is mentioned throughout the Gospel of John. Some people think it may be the author of John, and. Uh, he leans his head on Jesus's breast, and he. Um, there are all sorts of things that look, if you if you if you look at it right, uh, they they look a little bit gay. So that's that's one thing. And then the other person that he loved was uh, Lazarus, and that looked. Uh, uh, you know, the people who are making that into a, into a, a gay uh, a gay thing, and then the other two people would they were the sisters of Lazarus, and so they're saying actually that there's there's probably some he's probably bisexual actually that he loved both Lazarus. We have and a his title sisters. for the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> he loved both 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 Lazarus and his sisters Martha and Mary. They all they all had a thing going with Jesus. And, and you're telling uh, me you so, call this book strange flesh and not. Jesus, Jesus was a bisexual? bisexual? Subtitles. Well, I'm you missed out on a good Jesus. opportunity. I don't, I, I, don't, <laughs> I, don't really, I don't really believe any of this stuff, you know, because here again, I don't even know if there was a Jesus. Right. I, I certainly have no idea what his sexuality might have been. But what what believers, what the what, what gay the liberals are like are doing is they're pointing to these stories, and they're questioning Jesus' homosexuality. They're asking, in some cases, they're actually saying that he was the best, you know, that the evidence shows that Jesus was homosexual. And they do the same thing with Yahweh. Um, and you got to admit, there's some weird stuff going on with Yahweh. Uh, I mean, he's he he wants all, his prophets just about have to get naked. I mean, Isaiah's been three years. <laughs> <laughs> Saul, the first thing he does when the Spirit of the Lord comes upon him, he starts prophesying and taking off his clothes. You know, he lay, lay around in front of God and everybody naked. Um, God exposed himself to Ezekiel, showed the glory of the Lord, and he saw his loins, and they look like they're on fire. Uh, so moral of the story, there's, there's, when you go to your next orgy, bring a Bible. That is, yeah, that is what I've learned. This story. is making yeah. my day. <laughs> I'm so yeah. happy right now. <laughs> and these well, are the arguments you know, that liberal Christians can sometimes use to say, look, yeah. the Bible isn't as anti-gay as you think it is. Like, who cares? Exactly. <laughs> who gives a shit? Like, yeah, it's a bu- and, <laughs> and that's just the, the, the other thing is that most of the prophets were too, you know. So the, the, if you're going to condemn homosexuality, then you're going to have to condemn Paul, Jesus, Yahweh, and all, almost all the prophets. Um, at least that's what they're trying to make you. I mean, I kind of like after listening to you kind of expound upon this a little bit. I have to think that the reason the Bible is still quote relevant is because it's so damn long that people can find mm-hmm. anything they want in there, and I th- I have to think that's why it's still around. Like if it was, if it's it was a as giant long as... Rorschach test. <laughs> I'm saying that oh my bit. god, that's exactly right? what it is. Oh, R- yeah, Rorschach. You... Rorschach. Rorsch- yeah. Whatever. Wikipedia. Though. I don't. I don't. I don't think. <laughs> I don't think there's, I don't think there's an idea, any idea that, you, that a person could come up with that he couldn't find a justification for in the Bible. I mean, it doesn't teach anything clearly. 
What do you and that's hope? Why, you know, it's so co- contradictory. Sure. What do you hope is the goal? Anyone who reads Skeptics Annotated Bible or any of your other books, what do you hope they take away from it by the end? I mean, and no one, I, I don't think anyone reads your book straight through, not the Skeptics Annotated Bible because it's very long, but what do you hope anyone glimpsing any of this takes away? Uh, well, with regard to the, to the Skeptics Annotated Bible, what I intended it to be was just, if, if someone were to, to pick up the Bible and had never heard anything about it, I'd like to I'd like the, the skeptic annotated Bible to help them to make a good assessment about its worth as a moral guide, and whether or not it it uh, it has you know and also with regard to its truth value you know is is there anything any reason why I should give any importance at all to this book or should I just reject it outright? As um, I mean, there may be some good poetry here and there, but not very darn much, um, but. Um, is there anything that's worth worthwhile as a moral guide? And I, I'm hoping that, that it will be pretty obvious that, well, mm-hmm. not much. Okay, well, Steve, um, that about does it for us. Thank you so much. This is a lot of fun. I've and, learned a lot. Yeah, and Hemant, I have a birthday <laughs> coming up next week, and I do not own a copy of this, uh, this Done. book. So Done. We'll, play, we'll have links underneath uh, the information for the podcast for anyone who's interested in the copies. Uh, but, yeah, Steve, keep up the good work, and thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks so much, Steve. Oh, you bet. Been fun. Bye bye. Thanks for listening to the podcast for FriendlyAtheist.com. This episode was taped at Cinnamon Sound Studios in Aurora, Illinois, and the music was written and performed by Brad Chagdis. If you like what you're hearing, please consider making a contribution at Patreon.com slash Hemant. That's he T. We appreciate your support. I'm Hemant Mehta. And I'm Jessica Bloomke. We hope you'll join us next time.